Okay, so uh, welcome to Maxwell Instant Torah. <laughs> You're using the Maxwell House uh, uh, style. <laughs> Maxwell House coffee, everything. So Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat um, shalom. <laughs> Um, as you know, I got invited here to do the worst Torah portion or discussion that there possibly could be. So I'm going to go home and try to figure out what that I'll, means. I'll tell you a secret, Rabbi. Look, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts during the week. No about this part. Should be all <laughs> so I've decided to take, uh, no pun intended, but the bull by the horns. Uh, I thought we really... And for those of you who are still on, I thought we would talk about, um, yeah, this portion and the sacrifices and the whole system and so forth. So I think there's there's a lot here and there's a lot to discuss. But it's, you know, it, it's a technology of sacrifice and all that we just don't do anymore. So I thought I would just lead us through it a little bit. My first thought was to bring a pet and we could do a practicum, but I decided that probably wouldn't work so well. But you need to start off by saying, I think it's a question that came up before we started, that this system itself, the sacrificial system, and it is a system, and I'll show you its, uh, you know, its structure a little bit, but it didn't start out of nowhere. We have similar altars and similar sacrifices and piles of bones and whatever that we discovered archeologically way back into the Canaanite period. So really, have to do is read this as a, a Canaanite system of sacrifices that has been taken over by the emerging Israelite people and transformed into a specific ceremony for our God. But it wasn't invented out of whole cloth, so to speak. It really came from earlier sources and a lot of its structure, um, as we'll see, come come that way. Um, the system has three different parts. And, um, I was partially trained as an anthropologist of religion, so this is, this is my area. <laughs> the three parts, are, first of all, you've got the physical plant, right? You've got the Mishkan or you've got the Mikdash. It's laid out in a certain way, and it has to be out, laid out in a certain way, otherwise it won't work correctly, and you don't want that to happen. So there's the physical plant, right, you're right, how the Mishkan or the Mikdash is laid out. There's um, the priesthood, in other words, the personnel. It's a high priest or the priest, there's the Levites, there's various rules of, uh, uh, of purity, tahara and <clears throat> uh, ritual purity and impurity, and which priest or which Levite can go where, at what time, under what conditions. And then there are the sacrifices, which is what the whole thing is about. So certain sacrifices by certain priests at certain times in a certain place. And then the whole thing functions. And if that comes out of sync, then we have problems. And if any of you know much of the rabbinic literature, they are, especially around the calendar, a lot of issues. Because if you do the right sacrifice in the right way with the right people in the right place on the wrong date, it doesn't count. And if you do on the right date, the wrong sacrifice, it also doesn't count. So you've got to have the right calendar as well. So there are really four variables, place, people, the sacrifice, and the calendar, the time. And the, inter the interesting thing about time is that time, what month it was, was up, was up to the people. Right. All right, so you're raising, I don't know if you can, can you hear that? I don't know what you can hear. Yes, but I um, see and I see another part in the parasha, and that's a relationship between father and children. The well, there's, there's a lot of things, right. Right, uh, there's a lot of other stuff in this parasha, but I thought the sacrifice is just to focus on that, but there is a lot of, else going on. I'm taking the hard part. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then there's the sons of Aaron and what they did. Yeah, well, that's why I talk about it. Yes, yes, right. Um, yeah, um, we might get back to that later. Let me let me get the the whole. Let me get the. Let's do it correctly. Part done, and then we can worry about how you can do it incorrectly. 
Uh, but the calendar is a really big issue because of that. And, um, you know, when you suddenly decide to declare a new year, you're going to add an R. Um, there's all kinds of rules about when and how and so on because it moves everything. And if somebody has to get, it, it, if the word doesn't get through, then somebody's going to do it wrong. So it, this is complicated. Okay. So um, that's the background. So for the sacrifices themselves, they're basically only four, which helps a little bit. And I'll try to talk basically about two of them, but we'll talk about all four. One is, and, and they're all very similar. You take the animal and they're different animals that are appropriate for different sacrifices. So when we build the third temple and you go there and watch, you can tell which sacrifice it is by which animals are being brought up. So, and whether you eat it or not. And who eats? Is there a different animal for, for Zebach Tamid? I'm sorry? Is there a different animal for Zebach Tamid? For Tamid? Yeah. No. no, it's a burnt, it's an Ola. I, I thought Tamid was the Ola. No. I mean, some of these, I, I also have to be careful. Some, these terms shift. So sometimes that's a problem too. Uh, but anyway, for the sacrifices, the first of all, you bring a certain animal. Um, it is killed. You slit the throat. You pull off. You uh, what do you call it? Take off the hide, which goes to the priest, and then you chop the animal up into its component parts. And then it these parts are either burned or given to the priest or given to the person, the donor or burned outside the camp. And every sacrifice is a little bit different how you do that. But that basically structures what goes on. You take the animal, you kill it, um, you strip off the hide, you cut up the animal and you distribute the meat in some way. Yeah. But why do we need so many covenants? Of the mode of service in Yom Kippur, where you have a very graphic description of the sacrificial process, drop by drop by drop. Uh -huh. so you want to comment on that in relation to what you're saying? Yeah, so the, for the Avodah service, uh, uh, you do have a very detailed, it's being written later. It's, re, it's the rabbinic reflection on what the Torah said and what people presumably did. Yeah. But do we really need so many korbanot? Apparently, yes, we do. <laughs> um, I don't know. This is the system as it comes down to us, right? And let, do we need them all? I don't know. I can give you, you need a, a lot of sin offerings. Well, there are a lot of all kinds of sin and, and guilt offerings. Um, and I used to, when I taught at Case Western Reserve University, I used to, when we get to this part, we'd always start counting up the number of sacrifices. Uh, they were days when the priests were really, really busy. busy. And uh, it got worse in the winter because you have to do this before sunset, right? Mm -hmm. So they're kind of close to the equator, so it's not too bad. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, so there. So here are the four types, right? So what we had last week in last week's parasha was a description of the four types by type. This week we get the basically the same uh, content, but from the point of view of the priests. So this is like the priestly manual. All right, burnt offering, this is how you do it. So there's a burnt offering, or sometimes it's called a whole offering, W-H-O-L-E, because it's entirely turned into smoke, right? Well, or basically all of it's, you know. And there's the- call it the Ola, which means everything goes up in smoke. That's why it's called yeah, the Ola, Ola. right? Every, or a whole offering, because everything. Uh, the next is the Shlamim, sometimes called the whole offering, confusedly, or the peace offering, you know, shalom, shlamim, something. Um, and this is the one where the donor gets part of it back to eat, okay? Those are the two basic sacrifices. Uh, the ola is done every day. It's done twice a day, in fact. The shlamim, uh -huh. twice a day? Yeah. Morning yeah. and night. Yeah, yeah, morning and evening, or uh, yeah. morning and evening. Ooh. On Shabbat, there's extra ones. On holidays, there are extra, extra ones. On holidays, on which is called Moed, on Shabbat, there's extra, extra, extra ones. But yeah, there's that's yeah. A lot of animals. 
Oh yeah, well, I'm only. This is only one. <laughs> There's a lot of animals. Um, the shlamim is your general uh, workaday sacrifice. It is offered every day, but people can bring shlamim for various reasons. Thank offerings, for example, if for uh, giving birth to a healthy child. Um, well, healthy male. Um, sorry, I'm just a messenger. Um, but the Pesach is also a shlamim. It's handled the same way. So it's pretty relevant for this kind of time of year. So mostly when people brought sacrifices for Thanksgiving, for well-being, because they got over a disease, uh, you know, because their flight landed on time, whatever, you brought a shlamim. Then there's the sin offerings and the guilt offerings. Mm -hmm. Offerings and guilt offerings, in my view, look like they are made up as you go along, because they're very quite trying to discern whether when you did something wrong, it's an asham or a chatat. It's virtually impossible. Um, there are some criteria, and the chatat generally is as a you know the community or the priests or the leadership, but there are two sacrifices which have a lot of variation. So uh, the two biggies are the Ola and the Shlamim. In either case, so their, their animal is slaughtered on the north side of the altar. Its hide is removed and given to the priest. The blood is sprinkled and then the meat is distributed. And along with them is a libation, so a wine offering. And there's also a grain offering. It's translated different ways, a griddle cake or something like that. Um, matzah. So, huh? Matzah. Or matzah. <laughs> because some of it's unleavened, right. So there are various others. That, that's definitely that, unleavened. Yeah. But So anyway, we can talk about why the unleavened. Maybe that's something to talk about too. But anyway, this is all, this is true for all the sacrifices. There is a wine, there is a, a offering, there's a grain offering and so on and so forth. That's just part of the deal. Um, and by the way, if you want to look at the Torah portion, I'm not going to do too much reading in it, but it starts on um, 613. 613. So we were just talking about the uh, how odd it is that it starts on page 613 and what starts is commands you need to do. Hey, Rabbi, I have a question. Do we bring sacrifice for, for bad deeds or also, or also for bad thoughts? Technically for bad deeds. Because, and it's, you know, maybe if you've had a really bad thought, you might feel, you know, I'm going to bring my turtle dove just in case, right? <laughs> so um, it, it's not clear. I, from Leviticus, um, all you do is, well, if this person shows up with a chatat, this, is, this priest is what you do with it. So uh, sometimes it's not 100% clear. Uh, and I can imagine some people who are saying, uh, yeah, that was a mistake, but not a biggie. And some people who are like showing up every other day, you know, because they had a bad thought or, you know, something happened. I, who knows, right? Okay, so um, let me start with the Ola. And I want to I want to ask later on why there's a wine offering and a wheat offering or grain offering. I don't know, it had to be wheat, but there was a grain offering and a wine offering. These are very special foods, you know, bread and wine. And I think we need to talk about why. What, why are they so special in terms of the altar? So, okay, so if you bring a, any, any other questions or comments? Were most of the sacrifices animal as opposed to grain or bird or wine? Yes. So um, for some of the sacrifices, you could bring a bird if you couldn't afford a whole cow. I mean, a whole cow was, you know, that was an, an I, I really, I really thought maybe the meat offering was 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 a meal offering always. It might be. Let me look. It's, let me. Which means you were doing yeah. that twice a day. Yeah. Well, you were you were bringing a meal offering and a uh, wine offering with all the sacrifices. The burnt offering was done twice a day, so you brought all that stuff with it always anyway. You um, know, it's, it's yeah. very in, it's interesting if you go to Hawaii or I imagine Japan. Uh, but we saw this in Hawaii at one of the, um, you know, the volcano spots. Yeah. That the Japanese come there and they bring their sacrifice to Pella. 
And the sacrifice consists of some liquor, a small bottle of liquor, um, some money, some food, uh, two different, at least two different, and fruit. They, it's like they combine all of them. Right. <laughs> no, no, it, it's. Very, I mean, we once went before eight o'clock in the morning, so you know there were very few people there. And when we went up there, Michael and I looked at each other and said, "They're davening chakras," <laughs> and they were. They really were because when the minute we came there, they turned around and just sort of just you know stopped yes. looking at Pella and was just looking around. And it was fascinating because that wasn't the only place we saw that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so Hindu worship bring sacrifices and gifts to the gods. Right. So you take your, so the whole, the Ola, you bring, it has to be a male animal. It can be a bull, it can be a goat, it can be a ram, but it, in any case it has to be a male animal. Its blood is sprinkled on the altar. Um, its head and its fatty parts are placed on the altar and burnt. Uh, as are its legs and its entrails. And after these have been, uh, uh, they have to be washed. And then the entire rest of the animal is burnt on the uh, altar. The skin goes, to, or the hide goes to the priests. Um, if it's a whole offering that's a bird, which would be very unusual, but if it is, it's basically the same thing. You drain the blood, you remove the crop and the feathers, um, you take it out, take them outside the temple to be destroyed, and the rest of the fowl is entirely burned up. So that's the whole offering. My question is, in just a second, is why are we even doing what, what is this supposed to do for God? And what is a reich nichoach anyway? My question is, if were any of these offerings brought by the priest or something, in other words, with, with what, were all the animals, everything else supplied by the people? Because if you have, if you have the, the two peace offerings in the day, are you guaranteed that somebody from the crowd or whatever would bring something of that nature, or, or was something supplied by the temple? And so the the whole offering was was you paid a tax. Let's call it a tax, a temple fee to the temple every year. The temple bought the animals, raised the animals, made sure they didn't have a blemish or a, you know, some kind of imperfection. And then they were simply taken out twice a day and, and slaughtered. So that was all done by the temple administrative staff, AKA the Levites. Is that where the half shekel got used? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. I lived before in environmental laws, maybe a quarter, a half a mile from Oscar Mayer meat processing plant, and it stunk. Yeah, and but you get used to it. People would come and visit. How do you how do you uh, take the smell? You don't smell it anymore. So, I, the the priests must have uh, must have developed. Uh, they had a lot of gasoline. I, I well, I can tell you, I've got a worse story. When I was at uh, HUC, we lived in an apartment building that was right near a crematorium. Oh, and wake up some morning and find like gray dust on your car. Oh Ooh. my! Took some getting used to that too. Yeah. Anyway, oh. but yeah. So I mean, there was actually uh, in the rabbinic literature there's a statement about one of God's miracles was that when you're bringing sacrifices to slaughtering animals and spilling blood and entrails and this and this all day long, yet there was no smell and no flies. I'm not, I'm just saying it says that. I'm not verifying. What is the biblical significance of blood? For example, okay. some of my Christian friends have said, well, God wanted the blood, and therefore we know who sacrificed his blood. So they're going from a bull onto a human being. So right. what is the actual biblical significance of blood? And did God want the blood of the animal? Um. I don't, I don't know, and it's, it is a good question because blood is always treated differently. And if you know, if you, if you slaughter an animal in your backyard, you have to bury the blood. Yeah. Right? You can't eat the blood. The blood does not go on the altar. Well, I mean, it goes on the altar, but it doesn't get burned on the altar. It gets splashed around the, you know, the thing, the it's altar. Mess. And uh, with the with the meat you eat. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know whether this makes sense or not, but uh, we read elsewhere that we pour out the blood because the blood is the life or represents the life which I think they may have gotten to because when you bleed out, obviously you, you lose life. Right. Um, and obviously the blood carries the oxygen that sustains life. So you could look at it either way, but it seems to be connect, blood is connected with life. So I think it has something to do with that. And we could, we could speculate on what that something is, but I'm just offering that general thought. No, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, exactly why blood as opposed to anything else, I don't know. But yeah, blood is the life for whatever reason that they understood it to be. So the blood is always handled differently. Always, always. Um, so when we send up smoke to God in an olah, the reyach nikoah, right? Why are we even doing that? Like, is God hungry? I'm going to... I'm going to say we did, we did it because that's what the other civilizations around us were doing. <laughs> yeah. there, therefore, doing. we could we couldn't just cut it off and we needed it. Right. There's something in the text that said God would be pleased by the scent, the olfactory sense. And odor. there are some people odor. in some camps who teach that one of the signs of the arrival of the Mashiach will be something about smell. Right. I mean, if if you feel God has a sense of smell and the smoke is this barbecue, I'm from Texas, we call it a barbecue. <laughs> this barbecue pleases God, that's fine. I Theologically, I have some issues, but yeah. Well, maybe it's just also that it's an announcement to those around, uh, not just God, but everybody in the area will also smell it. And therefore it, it's it's recognizing it's a presence. Yeah, well, I like recognizing presence because we have earlier when Moses goes up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, there's a cloud, there's smoke, right? Or fog or something. Yeah. At the tent of meeting, there's smoke, fog, right? The, a cloud. So does this represent the presence of God? We're sending this cloud up. It's not that God is smelling it or enjoying the, you know, the odor. But it represents the presence of the Lord, like a cloud coming down. Light. Except this is going up. But you could, it, you know, in in its uh, Nelson trivialize it. But if oh, you it, give give Nelson a, a yeah, voice. Nelson, okay. you, we're going to say something. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say that to me, the sacrifice shows our confidence. God will provide us with enough food. That we don't have to eat everything that we have. We can we, we sacrifice it, right? And, and that uh, we won't do without. And so it, I don't know whether God needs this expression of our confidence, but but it's it is an expression of confidence. Yeah, and um, as as we'll see, there's a lot of animals getting processed this way. I mean, there's a lot of meat going on. Um, so I always have this image of biblical Israel with these big corpuscular priests because they're eating meat five times. <laughs> a day. These farmers are all vegetarians, right? <laughs> and all the priests get I wonder how they're collecting yeah. all the Yeah, and the priests all died at 35 and, you know, whatever. Um, I, I always wondered about how many people actually observed this. Well, now the burnt offerings, that was done and, in the and, temple. And I'm talking about the Shleimim and the Pesach offering, offering and the, the Shavuos one and the Sukkot, Sukkot one. Movement. I wonder how many really, really did it. Right, right. Because, for, yeah, you, it's a whole animal and you got to get it up to Jerusalem without blemishing it, which is a trick in itself. Well, and that's several well, days. You bought, back and bought forth. another one. You could do that. I mean, yeah. So um, anyway, so that's the burnt offering. Okay. So the peace offering which includes several subcategories. Um, it can be any animal from the herd or the flock, meaning it could be a, a cow or a, a lamb or a goat. It can be male or female, okay? Um, its blood is sprinkled on the altar. The meat is divided into three parts. Parts are entirely burnt on the altar, the inedible parts, you know, the, the entrails and all that kind of stuff. The fatty portions, uh, the breast 
uh, and the right thigh are given to the priest. The breast and right thigh are given to the priest. The rest is barbecued and given back to the donor. And then the donor has to eat it in Jerusalem over the next day. You know, it can't stay till the third day. Which is one day, which is two days. Yeah. Uh, this, this actually has to be, um, peace offering has to be in three days. So the day you bring it, the next day, the day after that, and then you throw it out. Only by that point you throw it out anyway. But, yeah. But, yeah. And so you, as the donor, <coughs> technically have to be in a state of ritual purity, and you have to eat it in a holy place, namely Jerusalem. That's the shlamim. So if you bring a, a Pesach, you have to, you know, be purified. You give it to the priests. You get a number. You know, they call your number. You get your your meat back, and you you and your family, whoever you brought it for, have to eat it within Jerusalem within the next basically two sunsets. Eating it in Jerusalem, that, that's Talmud, that's not Torah, because they were wandering in the desert for 40 years, right. and they didn't have Jerusalem initially. Right, no, but I'm we're talking about at the actual temple, but you're right, right. So if you brought it to, during, when you're in the wilderness, yeah, maybe you had to eat it within the courtyard, the outer courtyard. That you couldn't be. go in the inner courtyard because that was priestly. Okay, um, so peace offering could also be a thank offering. Um, and it's uh, also offered with a libation and wheat offering and all that. And uh, the priest gets one part of each of those, gets part of the animal, the breast and the right thigh, gets some, one of the griddle cakes, gets a little bit of the wine, the rest goes back to the donor. So it, it goes in, th again, three stages. Some of it goes up in smoke, some of it goes to the priest, the holy people, and some of it goes back to the donor. interesting that they don't mention any kind of spices that they use with it in other words it, it it sounds like it's a meal and yet it doesn't have the accompaniment right which which kind of is a little disappointing if you get it back and you just you know plain meat without any uh you know chili or whatever <laughs> Hyssop. Barbecue sauce. no barbecue sauce you know anyway um Okay, so let me say a little bit about the sin and the uh, uh, guilt offering, and then I want to talk a little bit about the bread and the wine. So uh, I'm going to read this from, from my notes. So for the sin offering, there are four kinds, uh, depending on who on whose behalf they are coming. Um, and they're all done for something you did wrong unwittingly. You say, oh, wait, I shouldn't have done that. If you do it wittingly, that's that's a different problem. But if you remember you did something wrong and you want to make up for it, this is you would bring the sin offering. Um, so it is a young bull slaughtered by the priests, blood sprinkled on the altar seven times. Um, its fatty portions are entirely burnt on the altar. That's like everything else. Uh, it looks like a peace offering at this, uh, shlamim at this point. The rest of the animal is taken outside the temple and burned. That's how you know it's a sin offering, not a peace offering, because of a shlamim. If it's a shlamim, you get it back. It's a sin offering. You don't benefit from it. Right? So the whole thing is burned. That makes sense. Okay. If it's brought for the community, the whole community did something wrong. Wrong calendar day, you know. <laughs> um, a young bull, it's slaughtered by the community elders. Not the priest. This is really uh, unusual. Uh, there is no sprinkling of blood. Again, really unusual. Uh, so this is some sort of other sacrifice that, that elbowed its way in. Otherwise, it's exactly the same as a priest's offering. Okay. If it's on behalf of the ruler, so I guess the Davidic king, um, it's done the same way uh, as the community offering, that is, except the king offers it instead of the priests, and there's no sprinkling of blood at all. If it's a commoner, you're just bringing it in because you did something, you can bring a female lamb or goat. Uh, you slay the animal, and everything else is the same. When you say female, was the animal female or the person who brought it female? 
For sure, the animal. Now, whatever happened if a female wanted to do, uh, I mean, someone didn't have a family or that was, of course, I, you mean, didn't it, so exist. Something wrong, is says, I want to bring a, I guess you would bring a female animal. Uh, you know, or a turtle dove or something like that, yeah. But could the female bring the offering? That's the that's my question. I don't know if the female could slaughter the animal if that would be kosher, so to speak. Well, I, I, I mean, that's the, a good question. The, the vast majority of the females would either have a, a brother, a father, or a husband that would right. do it for them. It, it would be very far and few between where a, there was a, a female who was, we had no family, that had no family to do it for them. Right. Well, you had the five sisters, so, you know. Exception. In which case, I would suppose they could do it. I suppose so. Yeah, and it's a good question. Uh, Leviticus at this point hadn't thought of that yet. <laughs> it's also Ruth. Yeah. It's also uh, Ruth and Naomi. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Good point. So, I, I mean, I'm just giving you a, a sketch of, of what you know, this portion says. There are three types of guilt offerings. Uh, so uh, you could do one of three things. You can bring a female goat, or it could be a lamb. Uh, it's like a sin offering, uh, except the priest gets some of the meat. Um, you can bring two pigeons or two turtle doves, and it's done the same way as the burnt offering. Or you can bring in just uh, flour, ten ephahs or flour, fine flour, and uh, offer that. Uh, so that's that's basically the system. Everybody feel ready to kind of once you see this happening, you know what you got. Uh, I'm Nelson, I'm yeah. for the past. What, what do they mean by fine flour? I mean, do they mean something like uh, really not coarse, or they mean uh, some kind of special grain? I don't think they mean a special grain. I'm speculating here. Um, but I, it seems to me when you bring an animal, you want to bring an animal that's more or less perfect, can't have a blemish or anything like that, right? Because you want to bring the best to the altar. I've got another theory of why. So I think with flour, you don't want to grab whatever is around in the field and bring it. You want it to kind of be refined, you know, maybe milled a little bit, something offer worthy. Is this a shower? I'm sorry? Shomer, uh, Shomer a flower, right. well, he guarded in the fields. And... Like a shirt, like a, a shmura matzah? Like shmura like, matzah, yeah. Right. So I think you want to bring something a little bit nicer instead of just some crappy grain that you picked up on the way. Is the way I'm reading it. You know what? It's, it's making me think, you know, today many recipes will say sift a flour to make it finer. I'm wondering if that's why they sifted back then to get the bugs out, uh, to get dirt out, uh, you know. It actually makes a difference. Hopefully today when you sift your flour, it's not for bugs or yeah, dirt. Yeah, sift, sifting know. makes a difference. Well, but yes, it is for bugs. And um, just fi finer, but maybe back then. Yeah, no, I think so. And I'm sure think you, you, wanna bring, you wanna bring good stuff to God, not, you know. You can't bring a diseased animal, so why should you bring crappy flour? You know, with moss in it, huh? With moss in it, right, right. You know, you don't want to do that. Uh, you want forgiveness from God. You don't want to crap things up at this point. Um, so, well, any other thoughts or comments about the system and how it works? So it's it's really a div division of the the. The wealth of the community, really, it's animals. I mean, that's the, those are the expensive things. And you're sharing it. You're, you're giving some of it up. You can say, I think it's going to God because God likes the smell. But I think you, you're saying, I'm willing to have this burnt up uselessly as a gift, right? Um, some of it goes to the priests and some of it goes to you, depending on what, what exactly is being accomplished. But that's the basic idea of the system. And you do it with animals, but then you also bring wine and bread. So, yeah. What, at what point did they stop or diminish it? I mean, for example, once you had the kings, you had Solomon and whatnot, 
there were people also in Babylonia. Right. So uh, they were not necessarily going to schlep their way there. And I know we had, that's why we have Torah reading and, and, and you know, services. But at what point did the people stop giving that many sacrifices? It was more like a, a to not a token, but you know, it was a formal occasion as opposed to uh, something that you did more very often. Right. So, I mean, the Babylonian Jewish community after the um, exile, right, Nebuchadnezzar and all that, is a really interesting community because they did not really have access to the temple at all. I mean, I guess they could have schlepped over, but it would be quite a journey. And they were in Persia, and the temple was part of the Roman Empire, right, later on. So it wasn't so easy to get back and forth. And don't forget, if you're bringing an animal, it has to be in good shape, so you'd have to bring the money, but it's different money. and it's So they developed a Judaism in Babylonia that was non-temple-ish, right? And we don't know exactly what they did, except when the second temple was destroyed, and we have the beginning of a post-temple Judaism, AKA rabbinic Judaism, the leaders who brought the ideas of how to do that were all from Babylonia. Think of Hillel, right? He's Babylonian. Several of the other early rabbinic scholars were Babylonian or were students of Babylonian. So somehow rabbinic Judaism had its seed in Babylonia. How do we do Judaism uh, without the temple? Right? What do we do in the meantime? Were sacrifices among the Romans and the and the Greeks and the other people also diminishing at this time? Also what? Diminishing. In other words, that there were fewer sacrifices to Greek gods and at at this point that we're talking about, like a, the turn of the millennium, right? Uh, the two centuries BCE and two centuries CE, sacrificial cults basically disappeared for the most part. So um, in that regard, yeah, Judaism wasn't that different. And uh, there was in the, I think in the 200s, no, it was after the destruction of the temple, there was actually an attempt to build another temple, but in Egypt, on the island of Elephantini. And they were writing back and forth to the Jerusalem priests or the Jerusalem rabbinic authorities asking how to do stuff. And they wrote back and said, it doesn't count. It has to be in Jerusalem. <laughs> so uh, you just can't build a temple every, anywhere. It, the, the, the place, the date, the people, everything have to coordinate. So you just can't build another Jerusalem temple in... Tel Aviv or New York or you know, like the Vatican. Huh? As, as I like said, like the well, Vatican. Yeah, There's but that's a, things that that as can I said, only be done in in the Vatican City. Yeah. Well, I thought there was a temple in Alexandria, in Egypt, a duplicate, and there were several others around the Middle East. They were several attempts. I know the one about in Egypt because they were actually writing back and forth to the Jerusalem priesthood who kept saying, no, 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 no it's not going to work. Um, there were other attempts, but none of them took, right? We go to synagogue. We don't go to, uh, you know, uh, we don't go to do sacrifices. But they, they built a temple on Elephantine. Yes, and they thought it worked. And, and, but again, it, it didn't survive. I mean, it's, it didn't start a Jewish tradition. Like... We don't do it that way. So I don't know if, the, if a third temple is ever built. Uh, are we going to start sacrificing? I don't know. Animal I always find it a little ironic that in, in, in the, the rabbinic prayer book, we pray for the temple to come back because it would make all the rabbis unemployed, right? <laughs> <laughs> I once mentioned to a Chabad rabbi, no. If the temple is built, he'll still operate. He'll still operate. <laughs> Good old spot uh, anywhere, right? <laughs> so, um, so, so let me let me go back to the bread and wine. Um, so, why do we have bread offerings and wine offerings? 
in addition to the animals, and each one of them, you know, does does have a, a libation and wine offering and a, some kind of bread. Uh, I shouldn't say bread, grain offering. Well, I mean, today I don't know why we have it, but today that's what's left is the wine and the bread. Right. That's what the wine and the bread is. What's left today? We do it every oh, week, every meal. Right. Well, not every meal, but we certainly do it every Shabbat. Right. Well, it's the sustenance of life. I mean, ah, wine you, and bread. You so need finished. You, um, you know, water the, the saying is you then, can't live by bread and water alone. Right. So you need wine. Bread and wine, you can get by, right? Right. Bread and wine, you can get by. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Christian Church, Jesus, the communion, bread and wine. Bread and wine. Bread and wine are big deals. This question is why. And I think I've got an answer. Right. Tell us. Yeah, don't keep us. You know, it's suspense now. So let, let me start off with a with question that doesn't seem connected at all. But um, if you have, let's say, an apple tree in your backyard, right? You pick an apple. Is that apple dead? No. No. Dead. Was it ever alive? <laughs> well, <laughs> presumably it was alive because it, you know. It, it, you it, don't know when it's, quote, done growing. As long as it's continuing to grow, as long as there's still sustenance from the tree, you would have to imagine that it is living. Well, and I'm going to go one step further and say the seeds are going to regenerate new life. Right. So there must be some life in there. Okay, but, but so, you know, even a dead body, the, the, the hair and the nails continue to grow for a while. I know, it's kind of creepy, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, but when you pluck it off the tree, any fruit, when you pluck it off the tree, have you killed it? Killed what? The tree or the fruit? The fruit, the piece that you've plucked. It. <laughs> because a tree will go on and do its thing. Sometimes they ripen, though. Many, many fruits and vegetables once picked. Continue to, continue to ripen for a few days. And and if the seed is still inside the fruit, if you plant that seed, it will grow. It will. Yeah. I think Jackie has just made the most important point. It's the seed that's technically still alive and being protected by the fruit and possibly sustained by the fruit. The fruit itself, though, per se, isn't alive if it's off the tree. The seeds right. are. Right. And okay, they'll throw the seeds away. I'm sorry. Often, when people ate fruit, they did not preserve the seeds and plant them, most likely. Right. Right. So the reason I'm asking this is when we come to grapes and we, uh, grain, probably wheat, but it could have been barley or oats. It doesn't, you know, one of the seven. One of the yeah, one of the seven. Um, when you harvest them, I think technically you kill them, right? Yes. I mean, that would seem to follow. Yet, both grape juice and grain can give birth to new things, wine and bread. So I think bread represent a kind of resurrection, taking a dead thing and it brings forth new life. It's interesting that the Muslims forbid wine. Right. I don't know what that's about, but. Yeah, that's about something else. But I think biblically, the, the, the offering of grain, of, of, of cakes, riddle cakes, whatever, and wine represents a kind of resurrection, a different kind of growth. And therefore, you offer them as well, okay? Because you're you're bringing first fruits anyway, but now you're bringing the growth from the first fruits. Wine is intoxicating. What about that? I don't think they cared because I don't think they drank that much. Now, there's a worry that the priests get. The rabbis worry about this. If you drink too much and you can no longer form a clear intention for what you're doing then what you're doing doesn't count because for the rabbis, 
part of what you're doing is what you think you're doing, right? And the question is, if you think you're doing this, but you actually do that, or you, you're, does that count? But I think um, that's the point. You're not focusing on God if, if you have lost touch with reality through excessive drink. Right. But to throw a little bit of wine on the altar or to take a sip of wine like we do Friday night, I mean, it's, you're not going to get drunk on that, right? Well, I'm past so big of mine. Well, past so, yeah, but you got four, four cups. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, that's what I think is going on here. You're bringing, you're bringing animals, uh, grapes, and uh, grain in, in perfect state, or you know, shift, sifted and, and animals without blemish. And it's not so much that you're offering them to God per se, but you're offering them in the name of God and destroying them as a sign of the recognition that part, part of the cultivation of these things is up to you, but part of it is God's, right? If God didn't bring the rain, you wouldn't, didn't make any difference how hard you worked in the field, right? So you want to acknowledge the divine role, right? So you kind of give some back and say, 90% is my work, but this 10% is yours. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if, because I'm seeing the role of it is twofold. Part of it is what Nelson said, because I'm thinking of Noah. Uh -huh. You know, it, to me, that was a thank you to God for having survived. So in a way, it's it's like what Nelson said, it's, it's a belief that God will sustain you and this is your way of giving up something as a thank you. But then I'm wondering if it also developed the other one being um, a sin or something that you've done wrong, and I know you know I've heard in, I, I, in different places that it's the animals being sacrificed instead of you, that it's being a replacement because part of it I'm thinking the sacrifice of Isaac. And yes, part of it was saying that you can't be like the others to have child sacrifices of people. You know you have to do it, but meaning that. You know, it wasn't perhaps a thank you that they were taking lives. And that's it. It may have been possible a thank you, but also saying that I'm sacrificing this. I did something wrong. I should be the one to lose my life. But instead, it's a replacement. I think that's part of it, too. Right? You're giving up something of your own livelihood, of your own wealth, of whatever. Um, yeah. And if you give a thank offering, I mean, you do get some of it back to eat. But not all of it, right? You're also nourishing the priest. You're also nourishing the altar, so to speak. So yeah, I think part of it is you're you're giving up something material. You know. Yeah. Well, that's the idea of membership in a synagogue. Yeah. I'm sorry. That, that is the whole idea that Chabad at one time would say, "Oh, you didn't have to join the synagogue. Come to, for the high holidays. It's all free." Right. And I know my husband used to be very upset. Yeah, but we want contributions, otherwise we're not going to live. Right. And neither are you, Chabad. So that, you know, in oh. some cases, you have to force people. Right. Right. I, I think that the, um, when we have our Shabbat, and we make bread, and we, and we have wine, I think, first of all, you're supposed to take some of the bread, some of the... Um, um, the challah? Yeah, the challah and burn it, which I think is representative of, of the offerings that, that, that we have. Um, and then I think that we're supposed to feel that, as you were saying, that there's something special about the wine and the bread. So the, there's, the wine uh, changes, and so one could say that God had something to do with changing the, you know the the grapes to wine, and then the bread changes too, and and changes from dough to something that's solid and and rises and all that. And one could also say that that is sort of God's, you know, changing of the thing to and, and represents exactly. what yeah. He does. Yeah. But when so we when we're yeah. willing to to give these sacrifices, uh, these are acts of devotion. 
right. you have to you have to feel that I may this is our poor way of saying thank you because we don't have any other way that humans can think of to say a devotion to God. Yeah, but the other side of that in terms of Leviticus and Deuteronomy is that you cannot just sacrifice an animal or give an animal to charity. It has to go through this temple process, uh, through the priest, through the temple. And that's what it is the connection between our secular lives and the holy, that it's not just something you can do in your backyard. Well, it elevates what you're doing to a exactly. different plane it's this trend it's this how do you bridge the gap between the the secular and the holy and the, the, what we've got in in levitica in vayikra is the technology of how that transfer happens and if you do it wrong it doesn't happen right it, it and as a matter of fact not only does it not happen i mean there's, there's more complications in here but if you do the wrong sacrifice on the altar, you're not doing a sacrifice on the altar, you're slaughtering an animal on the altar and that's, uh, that's contaminating. Mm -hmm. So it's got a negative side. If you do the wrong thing, you're actually, um, what do you call it? You're um, polluting the altar. But that's another whole discussion. You had a, yeah, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. I mean, oh, it does, but it does. I, I'm going back to the wine. Okay. And I was wondering if we have any indication today or any thoughts today of just how potent that wine was. I mean, today, wine could go anywhere from 0% to 13%, right. zero being grape juice and 13 being high test. Right. A lot of times, I mean, the, I don't, for like at the Passover Seder, they would water down the wine because it was so thick. Roman wine apparently was, was pretty, hot, you know, what do you want to say, high octane. Uh, and they would water it down. That's uh, right. one of the standard words. You know, you don't pour the wine, you water it. Yeah. Um, so we're almost out of town. I, time. I thought I'd just run quickly, if it's okay, of what sacrifices were offered when. And if you want to try to keep count, you'll see this was a pretty busy place. So daily, there was the two uh, burnt offerings, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Um, Plus the wine and the flour, but I don't have to say that. Shabbat, the same thing, uh, plus two daily sacrifices. Um, two burnt offerings, plus the two daily sacrifices. On the new month, two young bulls, one ram, seven males, uh, a sin offering of one goat, the two daily burnt offerings. On Passover, the burnt offering is above, a sin offering, uh, one male goat, the two daily burnt offerings, and then whatever anybody brought of the Pesach. Why was there a sin off? Because it says so. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I assume, and you just cleanse kind of, yourself. You know. uh, first fruits, you bring a burnt offering as above, a sin offering of one male goat, the two daily burnt offerings. New year, a burnt offering, a sin offering of one male goat, the burnt offering of the new month, right? And two daily burnt offerings. The Day of Atonement. Uh, same thing as above, a sin offering of one male goat, a sin offering of atonement of two goats. Remember, one of them then is sent off and pushed off a cliff or something like that. The two daily burnt offerings. The scapegoat. The scapegoat. The, or I call it the escape goat. Escape. Yeah. So on uh, Sukkot, uh, 13, 13 young bulls, uh, two rams, 14 male lambs, and then the 13 goes to 12, 11, 10, 9, you know, during the eight days the two daily burnt offerings. And then all the peace offerings, thank offerings, goodwill offerings that anybody wants to bring along the way. Um, people who made a Nazarite vow, all of that. So um, you can have a lot of sacrifices going on during the day. And the priest had to keep track of who brought this, who gets it back, what part is burnt, what part is given to the priest, what part... And if all of that's done correctly, then the whole system functions. And you know, if you read the prophets, when they'll say, why are we being attacked? And why is the temple being destroyed? We did something wrong in the temple. That's why all the Orthodox Israeli, anything in Israel, are allowing Israel to, I 
mean, if it weren't for them davening, the country would be in big trouble, is right. what they say. Yeah, exactly. Right. Oh, oh. Nelson. Nelson. So any thoughts? No, Nelson. Oh, Nelson. Yeah, sorry. No, I was just going to say that the temple system, as you're describing it, made it hard for Jews to reside elsewhere. They could travel, and they, and they did travel, but they had to come back to Jerusalem, which meant, I assume it, it also means that they were fighting between J Jerusalem and Babylon. They were saying, you're staying in Babylon. You shouldn't be there. you got to come back here. Right. And, and th I, I bet that went on. Um, and, you know, we don't know what the Babylonian Jewish community was doing for 500 years, right? But when the temple is destroyed and they're looking for a way of, and after Bar Kokhba, when he tried to reestablish the temple and, and, and that didn't work, all of a sudden these Babylonians are showing up and saying, 500 years later, right, after the exile, and saying, oh, we know what to do. We'd really like to know what they were doing. Like, where's their Mishnah? Where's their Talmud? We don't have anything. We just know they suddenly show up with all the answers. Well, all the answers. They, sh they show up with pre-Rabbinic Judaism. But then the, what was the Babylonian ta Talmud? That was... That's much later. That's 6th, 7th, 8th century. Yeah. And it is the Babylonian Talmud. Yeah. <laughs> so. Isn't it also why, especially like, I think after Solomon, when the king wakes up everything else, you did have different places that, you know, like in Tel Don, right. they set up, you know, a place there and different places to try to make the sacrifices. Yeah, I mean, part there of is... it was political, but part of it was because the people were perhaps grumbling that it was too far to go. Yeah. No, there's, this is a dynamic all through the prophets, you know, that you're supposed to do it in Jerusalem, not in your local altar, not in Megiddo, not in Shiloh, not in wherever. You have to do it in Jerusalem. And we, we do have proof of synagogues during the temple period. Uh, very At little. the second temple. Very little. Afterwards, we do it. They really blossom in the third, fourth century all right. over Galilee. They're everywhere. Right. Okay, so anyway, I wanted to give you a little bit of different view on, rather than just reading all of this, to kind of try to put it into a system. So uh, I think we're out of time. So Shabbat Shalom. May everybody have a good and sweet Shabbat. and Pesach. Yeah, and,